Our reading today is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning to the tomb, home from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what happened. The word of the Lord. Good morning. Happy Easter. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity. And a special shout out to the folks up there. You know, in real estate, they pay extra to be up high. And, uh, so that's not the uh, value seats. That's the penthouse suite up there. So thank you for that. Now, when I was a kid, I was fascinated by inventors. I wanted to be one. I wanted to invent something great. I wanted to invent something that would change people's lives, nay, change the world. And so, how hard could it really be? And so I got together with my sister, and with a little bit of outside help, we created our Mona Lisa, a true masterpiece. It was a system, a complex system of paper towel rolls, and toilet paper rolls that were put down the stairs basically as a roller coaster for marbles to go down the stairs. Now, I will, I will admit this morning that it wasn't quite market ready. <laughs> but I'm convinced that if we had only gotten the funding we needed, <laughs> it would have worked out very nicely for us. Now, you see, I was desperate to invent something, to start something, so much so that when I was in high school one time uh, in an auditorium, I had a tragic failed attempt at just starting a slow clap in the auditorium, and there is nothing more shameful than an unsuccessful slow clap. <laughs> but I do think there is something inside of us as people that longs for breakthrough longs for the more, that we have faith in this vision of human progress. Now, after all, in society, we, who do we celebrate? We celebrate the pioneers. We honor innovators. We say that some businesses disrupt the status quo, disrupt industries, and we mean that as a compliment. Now, back in 1962, uh, a philosopher and scientist named Thomas Kuhn coined the term, the now famous term, paradigm shift. Now, a paradigm shift is a fundamental change in one's view of how things work in the world. 
And so, for example, just some major paradigm shifts in even the last centuries, for example, the shift to Copernican astronomy, right? This shift of the earth or from the earth to the sun as the center of the solar system. Or maybe we think about Newtonian physics and gravity, or we think about our understanding of microbes, our understanding of the genetic code. A paradigm shift causes you to view life in an entirely different way. In fact, some of the views that we have today, some of the paradigms that today are now obvious and normal to us, were in their time controversial, controversial, radical, outrageous. But what I'd like to suggest this morning is the same thing that Christians have suggested throughout the centuries. And that is that Easter is the ultimate paradigm shift in human history. But more than just affecting history in a broad or general sense, Easter has the potential to change your life as well. Now today around the world, Christians are celebrating that some 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth emerged from the tomb alive after having been crucified and laying dead for three days. And for all of those 2,000 years, while the resurrection is at the very core and the very center of what it means to be a follower of Jesus today in the Christian worldview, the resurrection has also been a huge stumbling block for people over the years. And so because of that, sometimes what we're prone to do is filter out some of the resurrection stuff. And so we emphasize other, other things about Jesus instead, right? Jesus was a good teacher after all. We like that about him. Or he was a good man who had some decent life principles and life tips to share with us. He lived a good moral life. Wouldn't it be nice if we were all just a little bit more like Jesus? That makes me think about uh, Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson was the product of the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, He was very interested in science, in rationality, and in some of the theological questions that raised for him. Now, Jefferson was a big fan of Jesus, but he wasn't a fan of a lot of stuff around Jesus. And so this is true. This is what he did. He took a Bible took his Bible, and he took a razor blade and literally did surgery on the Bible to cut out all of the parts that made him uneasy, the parts that frankly seemed superstitious, that confused his logic. He got rid of anything that seemed mystical or supernatural, and he produced a new 82-page Bible that he called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth nicknamed the Jefferson Bible, and you can find it today in the Smithsonian. And his Bible ends with this sentence, there laid they Jesus and rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and departed. The end. That's how his version ends, because that makes sense. A man dies, he's put in a tomb, people clear out. That's how it's supposed to work. That's what our expectations and our human logic tell us should happen. Now, whatever you might think of Jefferson's approach this morning, I do really think that for some of us who are Christians this morning, it's all too easy to forget just how wild the claim of Easter actually is this thing we call the resurrection. Now, today on Easter, in some ways, it's almost a cute holiday, right? We have some pastels, and we go out for brunch, and there's some Easter eggs, and it's a good time. And I love brunch, by the way. (laughs) But when you think about it, Easter, it's actually kind of offensive. The resurrection is offensive to our logic, It's contrary to what we see around us. It's contrary to everything we've ever seen. And so in light of that, some of us who might just be, frankly, a little bit skeptical about the claim of the resurrection uh, or Easter itself, we might say this. Well, you see, today we know, in 2019, we know 
that people don't rise from the dead. But back then, it was a different time, right? They were into different stuff back then. They had a lot of different hobbies, and, and, and it was just, a, it was a different time. But you see, as modern people, I think we're very often guilty of what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, where we dismiss people from other times as less intelligent and more naive, just a bit more foolish than we are today. It was a different time. No, it really wasn't. People back then expected the dead to remain dead as well. <laughs> and so that's why, that's why in our text today, the women are going to the tomb with spices, which was the custom in that time after someone um, had died, because they want to lay those spices in the tomb because they thought there was a dead body in there. Now, it's interesting to me that pretty much everyone who experiences uh, the aftermath of the resurrection, who sees Jesus after this in the biblical accounts in the Gospels, pretty much everybody who sees this, uh, we find words like this to describe their reactions. Confused, frightened, perplexed. Nowhere in the Gospels does somebody see Jesus and say, cool, he's alive, just as I expected. <laughs> and so today, if you're here, and you're thinking about the resurrection, and you're just a little bit skeptical about the resurrection of Jesus, then you're in great company, because so were the disciples. The first doubters of the resurrection were the disciples of Jesus, his friends. And we read this. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. These words seemed like an idle tale, right? They dismissed the news. They dismissed these women altogether. Now, the term that's used here for idle tale is the same term, the same word that's used by ancient Greek medical writers to describe the babbling of a fevered and insane mind. Idle tale. Right? It's nonsense. It's fake news. Right? It's the kind of thing that you see in a supermarket tabloid magazine. You can almost imagine the disciples together hearing this report that Jesus was alive. And no, one, they're like, no one rises from the dead. Not after three days. Not after being beaten and whipped beyond recognition. Not after being crucified. Not after hanging on a cross. Not after having been pierced with a sword, not after having been wrapped with cloth and put in a tomb for three days. It just doesn't add up. You can imagine those disciples talking to each other. Ah, oh, Jesus, he was such a nice guy. You know, he said he'd rise again. He seemed to believe it. I guess this is done. Wow, too bad. He sure tried hard. Now, just like Thomas Jefferson, in that moment, the disciples couldn't imagine an empty tomb, only a filled one. But Christianity just isn't the same without an empty tomb. Without Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. Now, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, last Easter by uh, George Weigel who spoke about the uh, real-world historic impact of the resurrection of this thing that we call the resurrection, and how Christians went from this fledgling little group to by the fourth century being up to half the population of the Roman Empire. And he says this, there is no accounting for the rise of Christianity without weighing the revolutionary effect on those nobodies of what they called the resurrection. They encountered one whom they embraced as the risen Lord, whom they first knew as the itinerant Jewish rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, and who died an agonizing and shameful death on a Roman cross outside Jerusalem. And he goes on. That first generation answered the question of why they were Christians with a straightforward answer. Because Jesus was raised from the dead. And as they worked that out, their thinking about a lot of things changed profoundly. Now, Weigel calls this the Easter effect. 
that the impact and the scale and the growth, the explosion of early Christianity only makes sense if the first followers of Jesus actually believed in the physical, literal resurrection of Jesus. And he goes on to point uh, to some of the breakthroughs, the real-world breakthroughs that happened uh, in the ancient world because of Christianity in those early years. For example, he lists a few. A new dignity given to women in contrast to the classical culture of that time. A self-denying health care that was provided to plague sufferers while everybody else was running in the opposite direction. A remarkable change in the worship schedule of the people from the Sabbath on Saturday to Sunday, which was generations old. It would be the equivalent of today in America if next year we started celebrating Independence Day on July 5th. It would be that big of a shift. Or we think about the disciples and their willingness to embrace death as martyrs because they knew that death did not have the final word in the human story. They were living as if they knew the outcome of history itself. It's the Easter effect. Now, I did hear one person say that the idea of the resurrection makes Christianity the most irritating religion in the world. Because everything hinges on this one moment. That Christians claim that the resurrection was not just a pleasant story that kind of fills us with cheer and hope, but it was a historical fact. But maybe you wonder this morning, well, what if the apostles, what if those early followers were just lying? What if they were just making this whole thing up? But as one scholar pointed out, Why would the apostles lie? Liars always lie for selfish reasons. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get out of it? What they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture, and martyrdom. Hardly a list of perks. Right? No one's like, yes, sign me up for that. I really think that if Jesus had not been resurrected, that we wouldn't even know his name today. After all, in Rome, there were thousands of people who were executed. There were others who claimed to be the Messiah, and we've forgotten them all. Now, on the one hand, it's very, very important to investigate the evidence for the resurrection. But at the same time, I'm well aware that there is no argument that I could make this morning that would convince everybody. Because the resurrection is more than just an argument. Christianity is less about an argument than it is about an experience. And so Easter isn't just something to be believed, but something to be lived. And for Christians around the world today, when we celebrate Easter, when we celebrate the resurrection, we're declaring a number of things. First of all, we're declaring that in the resurrection, we can have true access to God because of what Jesus has done for us in his death and in his resurrection. Daryl Bach writes this, Without resurrection, Christianity is just another human approach to reach God. It is emptied of transforming power and hope. It's a mere shell, not worth the energy one devotes to it. To believe in Christ is to believe not merely in his example, but in the power of his resurrection to grant new life. And so Easter declares that we have true access to God. Easter declares also that we have forgiveness from our past. We have forgiveness from shame and from, uh, and from guilt and from sin and from regret in our lives. Easter declares that death does not have the final word. Easter declares that we have a lasting hope beyond the circumstances of today. Easter declares that we don't have to earn the approval of God and build some kind of spiritual resume for ourselves so that he'll accept us. Because in Jesus, that acceptance and that forgiveness and that new life and that new start over, that reset button, is freely given. Or as Andrew Murray said, a dead Christ I must do everything for. A living Christ does everything for me. And I can tell you this morning that in my own life, I've seen these things to be very true, very real. But imagine you are there with the disciples before you know the end of the story 
and you're huddled together in fear somewhere, after all you believe your leader is gone, that Jesus is gone, that Jesus is dead, the dream is dead, everything you hoped for, everything you gave, some, maybe some years of your life for are behind you now. And now somebody has the audacity to come into the room and tell you that Jesus is alive. You saw him die. You can't even stomach it. That was the tone among the disciples. But the text ends with this. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter wants to explore this, and so he runs from that place to the tomb to look inside, and it says that he went home marveling at what had happened. See, Easter challenges our certainties. The resurrection calls, calls us to doubt our doubt. The resurrection doesn't just shift paradigms, it shatters them. Now, a few weeks ago, on April 10th, news outlets everywhere around the world reported on the release of the first ever compiled picture of a black hole. It had been a, a hypothesis for decades at that point, but nobody had seen it. And a lot of it was made possible by the algorithm of one 29-year-old researcher named Katie Bowman. And rightly so, she posted about it on Facebook. <laughs> and I just love her face to see the reaction, the wonder, the marveling, when she realizes what had just happened. Now, of course, it's a huge development in science. It's a breakthrough that's going to unlock a thousand other breakthroughs. But I loved at the press conference, I read the report of one astrophysicist there who said this. This was his summary of all, of all that had happened. Today, we have seen what we thought was unseeable which is a great summary of Easter. We are invited at Easter to see what we once thought was unseeable. What if there's more to life than you currently believe? Wherever you are in faith today, wherever you are in, when it comes to church, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to Christianity, a basic premise of the Christian faith is that God has more for you. Hope, vision, clarity, love, forgiveness, meaning, and he's the infinite source for all of that. Why settle for anything less than everything God intended for you? And so Easter invites us to remember the wonder of Jesus' sacrifice for our rescue, for our wholeness, for lasting hope. And so today, let's go and see together. Let's go to that, that tomb. Let's stand open-handed before God. You know, if you give even a little bit to God, just even a little bit of margin, you can be amazed at what he wants to do for you, what he wants to, how he wants to reveal himself to you in a very personal, in a very real way in a very tangible way. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Join me in prayer. Jesus, we are so thankful for your sacrifice. We are so thankful that your resurrection worked, that it's real, and that it changes everything for us. Lord, I pray today for those of us who are here and we are believers, that we would never lose this moment. That you'd give us a fresh awareness of your presence this morning. And for those of us who maybe we're trying to believe or we've got questions, we've got concerns, Lord, I pray for anybody who's in that place today that they would be able to lay those concerns before you and that you would show yourself to them in a very real way this morning. We're thankful for what you've done, Jesus.
for what you've accomplished, for what you have for us. In Jesus' name.